Farmer Jerry, a fair share farm here. Rebecca Graff and I, we've been farming this land since 2003. You know, we're looking at uh, kind of two ecosystem services we're looking at is the soil microbiome and really the human microbiome. We have found through just some of the science that's come forward today that really what's going on at a, at a root level in, a, in the soil microbiome is a lot of the same microorganisms as are what's going on in your, your uh, gut microbiome. And then that's why we have the live culture food. We wanted to produce a value-added product that reflected the amount of effort that we put into building our soil. So this is a way to kind of tie that all together all those ecosystem services. And then uh, Rebecca's family, they have the, they own this land and we only rent 20 acres out of 260. And a lot of the rest of it is in Indian grass for seed production. So that's a way to build, um, collect native grass seeds so that other people can use that on their land for conservation purposes, looking at uh, collection of uh, forb seeds too, like milkweed, different types of milkweed. We feel is that it's, uh, you almost can't silo all these different ecosystem services because it's all indivisible. So we're really trying to pull everything together on the farm. So we have food production, um, we try to build a lot of biodiversity, we have pollinator habitat, we have a wildlife corridor where we try to uh, accommodate the wildlife in the area. You know, our, our field is pretty wide and we always had animals trying to bust into the um, farm. So we decided to make a corridor in between because there's water on the one side and on the other side there's creeks where they're going to. So we're really kind of right in the, in the way. So we decided this was an area like next to a tree line. We didn't really farm it. That we should just, it'd be an extra gate that you'd have to open here and there. But um, so we put it in. Uh, one nice thing about it is, you know, we have a trail cam, so every once in a while I'll set it up out there and we've seen bobcats and, you know, uh, does with, you know, newborn fawns and coyotes and owls and rabbits and everything. And it's kind of neat to see them, how they act when you're not watching, you know? And I think it's been helpful, like the, the bobcat uses it. I mean, we're uh, kind of a little refuge over here. And the more you drive around and see there aren't refuges for animals, the more important it is, we feel, for us to kind of fill that void. And we had a CSA for 18 years, Community Supported Agriculture. It was a participatory CSA where our members would come out and help us harvest and have that kind of be a work requirement. So that was a model we um, picked up in the Northeast, when, which is where we met on a CSA farm. I was an environmental engineer before that, so this is kind of a, for me, more of a real life extension of environmental engineering. And then uh, kind of where we are today in 2016, we um, built a certified kitchen for uh, live culture ferment production, and that's what we're focusing on now. Yeah, I tell people, uh, I used to be an environmental engineer, but nobody ever talked about the environment. So that's a big part of it for me to be truly connected to the land. You know, the life in our soil is what is the um, source of the life in our ferments, and we eat them all the time. So Rebecca and I are quite literally connected to this land, the life in it. I mean, it's not a spiritual thing, it's like it's real. And I think that alone, to be able to do that, is kind of part of the search. And then the next step is to understand it and articulate it. And um, that's what we want to do. I'm Rebecca Graff. I'm the fourth generation of my family to be a steward of this land. And my husband and I started an organic vegetable farm here in 2003. And we grew a wide variety of vegetables for a community supported agriculture program for 18 years. The agroforestry project came out of our quest to figure out the 
the solution to the problem with um, the way that our farm holds water. We are in the Lus Hills and um, that was windblown soil. So it, it, there's a very deep layer of soil, but the bottom layers are very clay. So we are really good at pond building. You can build a pond really easy on our farm, which is not great for vegetable production or for even trees. You know, a lot of things struggle with just the nature of clay being both not great in wet periods and not great in dry periods. So in the past, we've, we've had issues with our annual vegetables where we get a big rain and um, we lose crops due to flooding, basically water sitting. Um, for too long. And so we've been doing different things over the years to tackle that problem. Lots of cover cropping, lots of organic additions like, you know, lots of compost and mulch. But we, five years ago, read this book called Restoration Agriculture by Mark Shepard. And it made a lot of sense what he was doing at his place um, as far as working with the water getting it to move through the farm, getting it to infiltrate into that more compacted layer of subsoil. So we did a couple things after reading his book and also going to a workshop. We have a subsoiler that we drag through to open up that clay layer. And then also we've put in, I don't know, a mile, a couple miles of uh, berms and swales that are um, on contour every 40 feet throughout our field. So, you know, we're on ridgeland and there's ridges and valleys. And, uh, you know, we tried to farm on the contour as much as we could in the past, but it was always kind of difficult with trying to figure out exactly how to make that work. The, the berms are laid out to bring water from the driest parts of the farm to, or from the wettest parts of the farm to the driest. You know, every 40 feet, between the, between the berms, we can grow a block of vegetables. So that's kind of, now we have a very standard kind of way to farm on contour, but also have blocks that are uniform. In the past, there would always be hills and valleys within our growing area. And now they're very uniform because we are farming on the contour. And then the, the berms collect water when it rains and slows it down. So it doesn't just rush off of our fields. It has more time to infiltrate and get into those deeper layers and also uh, lets the water percolate into the soil. Redfern. This is where the Redfern grows natural farms here in Independence, Missouri. We're a diversified vegetable operation here. We're farming on about three and a half acres of vegetable production. What we do here, we, we really try to reduce the amount of even organic sprays that we use for pest control. We, we do several things to try to encourage beneficial animals, insects and animals, creatures here on the farm. So um, we'll probably go to some areas where we've planted some native planting berms that have a lot of flowers and stuff that um, just attract beneficial insects, allow them to nest there, overwinter there, uh, like green lace wings, uh, beetles and things like that. Lots and lots of, if you look around the farm, you'll see lots and lots of ladybugs. In the, in the greenhouses, we, we release some beneficials and then we just try to help them thrive as well. Some parasitic wasps, especially for aphid control. Um, so we also have a lot of uh, riparian areas along the farm. So the fence lines, we've got uh, native wind breaks that we've planted here on the south side to protect against the wind and also that provides habitat um, space for like birds and other creatures around the farm. Uh, we have a whole, down one side of the whole property, we have a creek and we have ponds out here, lots of frogs, um, lots, of, lots of birds. So, so we try to kind of work with nature and sort of live in a symbiotic relationship with that. So in the greenhouses, especially in the winter time, the biggest uh, pest that we deal with is aphids. Um, they really thrive in cool temperatures and, you know, 
in a heated greenhouse especially that's maintained especially in the springtime their, their numbers can really uh, grow quickly so we don't like to spray for aphids um, for one thing we would kill beneficial insects if we did um, and another thing it's almost impossible to kill them all because they're usually on the underside of leaves and they replicate so quickly so all you're gonna do is probably kill all the good guys and hurt some of them and then they're gonna come back with a vengeance so um, what we've had a lot of luck with is uh, aphid parasites ladybugs also help but uh, there's some other uh, good beneficial insects that can deal with them, but what we found the best are the aphid parasites. So if, if Aphidius colmani is the one we like the most that will release a, smaller than a mosquito, like a gnat, and they will parasitize aphids, and then the larva will actually emerge from the aphid itself, and then they'll go parasitize a whole bunch more. And uh, they can rep replicate really quickly as well. And the problem is uh, sometimes they'll parasitize so many of the aphids that they'll completely wipe out the aphid population and then they don't have anything to parasitize and then they die out too. Um, so you need a host for them. And unfortunately they'll die out and then the, the aphids can replicate faster and so they'll come back. So what we do now is we, we actually raise aphids, but a different kind of aphid. So we raise a wheat aphid. Uh, we, so we grow wheat grass in a place where we don't have any wasps protected from the wasps we would, and they just naturally propagate and go from the last seeded ones to the freshly seeded ones so every week we're seeding more uh, wheat grass and then once it's established and nicely infested with <laughs> wheat aphids we move those into the high tunnels and those aphids won't hurt our crops they're they really like monocot kind of crops so they don't hurt tomatoes or lettuce or anything that we grow so but they're just there for hosts to keep our aphidius colmani our aphid parasites going so if they actually wipe out all the other aphids every week we're bringing new aphids in and so we always have a batch of uh, aphid parasites we don't have to keep buying aphid parasites in or, or have to notice that there's a problem and then have to wait for the delivery to get the aphid parasites. And so it allows for more of a balance of good guys and bad guys in the tunnel. <laughs> I never thought I was gonna be an aphid farmer. <laughs> it's so weird. Like, oh, look at those aphids, there's so many, it's awesome. <laughs> We're also looking at the possibility of uh, agriturismo um, to try and get people out to the farm to kind of experience it. Because talk about ecosystem services, most people don't know what that means, let alone how you can integrate all of them. So to be able to have people be able to come out here and um, experience it, we feel is a better way to educate people on that. You know, we're trying to get more of the animal crop mix to have a diversified farm kind of ecosystem services of having you know grazers as well as you know our annual production so the chickens have been a good system since about 2012 they've really helped us with our um, our fertility you get a lot of phosphorus out of chicken manure and so we'll fence them in an area like in one of our blocks there and leave them for about a month and that those areas where we do that it really helps our vegetable production and then we get the eggs out of it and they actually scratch up the soil sometimes you can just go in and kind of cultivate the soil a little bit and the ground's ready to plant they've done all the weeding and kind of the the prep like i said to us we feel that it's all connected um indivisible as they say so if you're going to be trying to uh you know, conserve farmland, which is one reason Rebecca came back here is farmland preservation and have a healthy uh, land. You just have to take all those things into account that people might consider ecos ecosystem services. So um, it's just a healthy ecological system really that human, humans can cohabitate in and in our case have agriculture where you can produce food at the same time.